Crikey, Chris Bewley, we are back and already ready for this next match in the first round of the Clash Bash. Now, Chris, I really missed you yesterday in that game, so I just want to extend a, a little bit of a virtual hug, my friend. So thank you for joining me today. Oh, Ethan, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I am extremely excited to be part of this awesome, innovative new series, uh, Clash. Thank you very much for having me. Um, hi, team. My name's Chris. I'm a massive Marvel aficionado, and I like to play a little bit of flesh and blood from time to time. So I'm ready to roll today. Really? Is, is it in that order? You, you prefer Marvel, then flesh and blood? Why are you here? <laughs> well, if we're talking about rarities, uh, I can definitely be swayed towards a beautiful white bordered card, but Marvel is definitely where it's at. Oh, I, I get you. Ah, a little coy. I like that. I like that. Um, well, great, Chris. It is amazing to have you here. Uh, but for anyone who is brand new to this, let me just jump into the rules a bit so you're all caught up on what exactly is Clash. Now, Clash is a young hero format where we really are chasing this thematic feel of playing a little bit of a toned down hero compared to Blitz. And we're going to achieve this by actually allowing any rarity only in the hero, hero specialization, mentor, and weapon slots. The rest of your deck needs to be common or rares, and we're going to follow the commoner ban list. The rest of your deck, all these 60 cards, then gets to be pre-boarded around, like Chris had said, down to presenting at least 40 cards. So there's uh, a lot of nuance in this format uh, that you don't get in Blitz without some of the huge power level spikes that are also accessible behind a lot of things like Majestics and Legendary. So we're hoping to bring something really exciting, really fresh, and also new player friendly, uh, because right out of the box with Classic Battles, those decks are actually Clash legal. So if you have any friends that are interested in the game, this is something you really want to potentially look at uh, for a great new player experience. Yeah, that's right, Ethan. So we've got the the nuances, which to me largely comes across in the form of that pre-boarding. The other thing, well, the thing that I love the most about this format is the integration of the lore. It's about the hero. It's about the mm -hmm. character. It's about what they can do. And like you've touched on a few times, it's almost like their journey into becoming a full-fledged hero. So I love how you can still use a Hanabi Blaster, or you can still use a Teclo Core. These specializations in whatever rarity, because of course, if it's connected to your hero as a specialization, or even just in that weapon inventory slot, you can use whatever rarity you like. You can go Majestic, you can go Fabled even, if mm. Viscerai somehow in the mix so it's that it's that real connection to the story of the hero that has got me most hyped for the format wow what a great sell chris and i think you articulated it better than i ever could and uh, speaking of what i want to see more of let's take a look again at that bracket now we already wrapped up the game yesterday uh where we did see wes wilson take that win over leviah with dash uh but reminder Tommy Fresh on Leviah is not quite out. He's moved on to that loser's bracket well, where he will be playing the loser of this matchup, uh, whereas the winner will be playing Dash and that scary uh, list that Wes built together there. So uh, that, that'll be coming up after the resolution of this game. So today, today, two new challengers enter the ring, Chris. Who are they? Well, we have everybody's favorite assassin, Red Zone Rogue, playing everybody's favorite assassin, Arachne. And of course, Arachne has just arrived from Dynasty. A little bit of a surprise appearance, some might say. And that is a very, very exciting hero to see. Many of Arachne's cards are of the common and rare rarity. So there's still going to be a massive punch coming from Flesh and Blood's latest hero. And then of course, maybe Flesh and Blood's biggest villain of all time. <laughs> Good old Chain. Mm. So we have Chain coming through today as well. And it's really, really exciting. A little bit scary. Uh, a few cards, such as the aforementioned Stubby Hammerers. Everybody's favorite action, Seeds of Agony. And um, yeah, Chain's got access to a lot of mm. things. So we've got uh, Red Zone Rogue on the one side. And then on the other side, Unfortunately, I cannot see the name of the player. Oh, we got Mo Bogsley, Mark Johnson. It's all right. He hasn't made a big splash out there in Australia, Australia or New Zealand, but we know him well in the American scene here. He is a scary, scary blitz player when put behind the uh, the pilot seat of Kano and Prism. 
I haven't really seen him play much chain, but he's the player with a lot of know-how, a lot of skills to show off in this kind of matchup. So I'm sure he will do the deck justice and make chain the boogeyman that we already know he is. So actually, let's take a look now at that chain list uh, that Mark has put together here. So the idea behind what he's trying to go for, of course, is still abusing cards that were previously, uh, you know, banned in formats like Blitz and Constructed. Uh, we're seeing the full suite of Seeds of Agony back on the table. Now, this card obviously has that amazing combo that you can go for with Riftbind, and they're both cards just in that common slot, something that was balanced around the draft experience uh, will probably come up pretty big in this format as well. It's also very nice to have just the one of Razor Reflex in the list here, which is always going to keep any opponent guessing. Of course, they see one, they're always going to be thinking about how many more there could be. We've got those big hitters such as Plunder Runs. We've got uh, the blue and the red one, and that should be plenty to, once again, get that extra oomph coming out of the arsenal, playing those actions to keep Chain's plan going of do something, go again, do something, go again. We've even got a little bit of Fate Foreseen action going in there, and I think that is a testament to this sideboarding and pre-boarding option, which is going on in the Clash format. So I think Fate Foreseen, it could be coming in against Arachne, because uh, some of those on hits, dis despite each, pretty much each of Arachne's on hits being Banish the top card of your deck, some of them are more threatening than others. So I think it's nice. It's a very nice hedge to have just a little bit of defense reaction presence in the list there. Yeah, and it's also to note that in this format, uh, you have the 60 card deck. You're not forced to board all the way down to 40. Uh, so maybe this is the kind of deck list where Mark just takes the entire thing because he's afraid of a little bit of fatigue coming out of the list that uh, Red Zone built here for our new hero, Arachne. Let's take a look. So the Arachne list here, uh, hey, all this is new to me, Chris. I have not played much with this assassin, uh, but you're right to point out all these little hit effects uh, that he's got on every one of his assassin attacks. Yes, it's going to banish the top card of the deck, and at first you might think, that's pretty scary, because the chain might get good value out of a blood debt banish, but at the same time, maybe there's a bit of push with fatiguing out a chain that the additional banishes can add to this uh, game plan that Red Zone has into him. So I think it'll be really interesting to see what strategy he ends up going for. Uh, you see that Red Zone's deck has a lot of ways to pump on top of those attacks as well with Shred and Razor Reflex. He's really looking to just make sure these contracts land and rack up that silver. A rack up that silver indeed. <laughs> and this is this hero is not only super exciting to me in general, it's one of the heroes that I um, already feel a bit more of an attachment to more than others. And this is a very, very cool list. And it's this hero and this matchup in particular, Arachne versus Chain. There has never, ever been a more relevant fatigue deck them out scenario that I've ever seen in Flesh and Blood. Of course, Chain is looking to build up the soul shackles, banishing more and more cards as the turns go on. Arachne very often does like to play a medium to long game. Most Arachne decks are going to be looking to be very defensive, defending a lot. Almost every card has three defense on it. And yeah, those, those contract completions where a card's being banished off the top of the deck, that happens a lot faster than one might imagine. And even though we don't have Eradicate, which is the card that uh, Red Zone Rogue previewed as part of the incredible, incredibly put together Dynasty preview <laughs> season. Red Zone Rogue doesn't have Eradicate today, which is, of course, one of those majestics, the damage doubt that will banish X, where X is the damage of those cards, which can shred the deck to pieces in seconds. There still is a highly realistic chance of the chain player being completely out of deck. Yeah, I think uh, ideally going into this matchup, uh, Red Zone might be looking to take the first few turns pretty aggressively, uh, but as soon as he's forced down to pivot to blocking out just because of the amount of soul shackles that chain's racking up, I think this deck's actually pretty equipped to do that. So, hey, this might be a pretty exciting one. Does it get down to fatigue? Does chain just roll over our poor friend Arachne here? Let's find out. And on screen today, we've got Arachne versus Chain. Now, we know Chain is a boogeyman. It's been proven in both Classic Constructed, it's been proven in Blitz, but we just don't know that much about 
this arachne hero very mysterious very new uh so i'm really excited to jump in and see what these players can bring to the table here is it a bit of a fatigue matchup is it a bit of a race matchup what do you know chris yeah well arachne is very much a mystery it's Arachne has a lot of incredible attacks, some amazing on-hit abilities. And Arachne can at times be defensive. A lot of these attack, a lot of these assassins have three defense on them. And a Spider's Bite can really mess things up a bit for the defending player. So the Bite will come in for one. If they're choosing to defend with equipment, that power will go up to two. If they take, if they take the damage then your next time the next time that you're going to defend with an attack action card the value of the defense will go down by one so that'll make things a little bit more tricky but if you defend for two hey no damage done no and this is actually turn zero right kel actually elected to go uh first here so i think what his plan was and we're seeing come to fruition already is cheese out some damage due to cards like Shred, perhaps maybe Cut to the Chase or Raise Reflex as well, to put Chain a little bit behind on life as early as turn zero. So Spider's Bite does get to land thanks to Shred there, and now that debuff effect will be in play as well. So this next attack that's contracted is also going to come through and trigger Arachne's ability and give Kel a little bit of information about what he wants to do with the top of Mark's deck, because this is relevant. This is turn zero, so Mark will be drawing up at least that one card because he's down a card due to that blue plunder run. So he chooses to bottom it. What does that tell you? Yeah, well, Fleece of Frail was contracted to banish cards two or less, and of course, Vexing Malice, the blue, is very much two or less, costing zero, but key with a lot of the Arachne hero ability is not so much acquiring the silver, but manipulating what the opponent's going to draw, and by putting a blue to the bottom, that could very much uh, put a spanner in Mark's work, so being able to pay for things. He's defended for four. We've got two on each of these cards, so uh, Fleece the Frail. Well, it's going to land because four. of the Shred, actually. The, the Shred, it doesn't straight pump, so even though that's a yellow Shred, that would subtract something by three. Since both of those cards were just base two, uh, it's going to leak through a little bit extra there on Kel's side and actually get a Banish off that Kel was not really expecting, but definitely eager for because it did trigger the Contract. Contract closed, silver made, blue captain's call banished. Yeah, so that's two blues going to the bottom of the deck for Mark now, sorry, being banished or just out of the way. Trying to reduce the number of cards Mark will be playing each turn, but of course, there's a little bit of a risk when you banish a blind card off the top. If it's blood debt, maybe I'm going to give Mark a little bit of a boost. So that's something Cal's not going to know if the top card is, of course, unknown it's a risk that arachne is willing to take but over time as chain soul shackles add up the risk of being legitimately fatigued to zero cards in your deck is a real possibility speaking of soul shackle we are starting off we're giving a rift bind go again it's coming in for three yeah and you know that three base looks pretty weak as of now but that's because chain's early game is Normally, the only point in which he's weak, that first potentially one or two turns, because as those soul shackles rack up, the ability for Chain to basically gain intellect as those blood deck cards are banished becomes really overwhelming. So a slow start is definitely Kel something Kel wanted to see out of the chain, and it's actually a lot slower than even a normal turn, because Rosetta will not get the two arcane through. There was no non-attack played here. So that's a five damage turn one. As the aggressor going second, that's that's something Kel's definitely got to be happy about. Yeah, it is very rare to see Rosetta Thorn coming in for just two physical. Cal will be over the moon with this one. So it could indicate that Mark has only attack actions in hand, and getting rid of blues or very valuable actions is a key part of this plan, such as Captain's Call not being able to be played. We're coming in with another Spider's Bite here for one piercing on that of course if uh if we choose to defend with while well, the only option is the chest piece being able to block this damage here but one coming in we're threatening the reduction of the defense value on yeah. a second hack yeah and and that damage reduction you know it's probably not going to be a big deal now because chain's in the position to just say yes i'll eat this yes i'll eat this but there might come a point 
where the chain is on the back foot and life starts to get really tight because of having to deal with little blood debt ticks here and there, uh, that, things like Spider's Bite, with that negative effect it has on blocking can really come up. But for now, Mark is very happy to just say, yeah, I'll eat it. And then with this second attack coming in as well, most likely to say, yeah, I'll eat it. Yeah, Slay the Skull is coming in. It's contracted to banish attack action cards. We saw an attack action card on the top, but it went to the bottom. Now, there's some risk to this. Um, we, we're not looking to have Mark draw that attack action, but this being put to the bottom gives the chance of a blood debt card being banished on hit. We're going to cut to the chase here, pumping this card by two attack, having another look. Of course, the attack reaction itself gives you one more chance to look at the top of the deck. We've revealed a blue. We've kept it on top, possibly knowing well, knowing that this one card being banished is not going to help the blood debt strategy. So it's a reasonably safe and smart play from Cal keeping that one on top there. Yeah, I think what Kel has done so far with these bottoming, topping, banishing, everything he's done to that regard, it's been to control the blue count that he's seen out of Mark, because we saw that Vexing go to the bottom, we saw the blue Captain's Call get banished, and then now intentionally keeping that blue Mavrian Skies to banish as well. Kel's going for a strategy, it seems, to just try to hit that resource base and make Chain draw all red hands that clunk up, because it's something that can happen. Chain is a resource-intensive deck, it wants to banish its attacks, it wants to draw its resources. But this does mean that top Soul Shackle banish was completely blind. Uh, wow, Kelt... and uh, what a banish it was. Oh yeah, that's uh, red bounding. That's actually pretty big, because in a sense, Kel actually helped Mark get there. That was a bottom, and then a top, and then a banish. So that bounding was three cards deep, and now here it is already getting banished by the Soul Shackle, and it's going to be playable on a turn that we can already see is going to be so, so big thanks to a red plunder run from Arsenal. That sucker is going to pump the next attack by three. It's going to make the next attack that hits this chain also threaten a card draw. And Mark's not done there. He's continuing to buff this next attack with a Captain's Call. Oh my goodness, this could be one of those chain turns. Yeah, this is really looking like a chain from the days of old. And there's a seven point life difference here, but there's a whole lot going on already. The Rosetta Thorn is already turned on, ready to deal an extra two arcane damage if it does come in at some point. We're activating Ebon Fold here. So we're going to banish a shadow card from the hand. It looks like a Rift Bind, which is a very good one. We're drawing a card. So it's essentially drawing two cards if you look at the Blood Debt Rift Bind being put into the banished zone. We're giving something go again with Soul Shackle. And here comes the Bounding Demigon that some say Cal put into Mark's hand himself. <laughs> Nine attack right hey. to the face. Look, Kel is just such a friendly guy. All right, it was just his gift over here to Mark, but I'm sure he wasn't expecting it to be all the way up to nine damage. Uh, that went from a base three all the way up there, threatening now the on-hit draw card, which is going to go through. Uh, and that's just something that when a turn can go this wide, as it most likely will, they just have to accept. Plunder Run is threatening the next attack that hits, uh, draws a card. So unless Kel thinks he could actually block out the entire turn, at some point, that card was always going to happen, and he goes ahead, lets it through on that first one to let Mark have a little bit more information, come in with that blue Rift Bind that didn't immediately have go again until the Razor just hit it. And <laughs> there's oh, no yeah. way Kel can be happy about that. That's that's a lot. Yeah, not only did the attacks keep coming, but the Goat Agains are also involved, as well as the height, the verticality on the damage here, going from very little to six to nine a one of Razor Reflex is coming in clutch here, and we have now moved to Mark taking the lead in life. Meet and Greek coming in for another four. Oh, this is so people. dirty. Now, it doesn't have a Nate go again because no arcane has been dealt yet, but you best know it that Rosetta Thorn is turned on at this point. So if Mark really wants to push, sure, the meet and greet doesn't have go again now, but Snapdragons can make this turn potentially threaten a whole nother five damage if the meet and greet hits. So this is just becoming overwhelming. Uh, and this seems like, you know, just a just a turn two out of a chain. But as soon as you hit on that first soul shackle, look at what this unlocks. It's a whole nother attack that gets worked into the cycle here. Yeah, very, very wide chain. We had 
we, it's, it's not so much these days we get to experience the joy of ebb and fold, but that's been very much a part of the massive plays this turn also. We've made another rune chant, and here comes the Rosetta Thorn. We've got one arcane from the rune chant, two arcane from the thorn, and then another two physical from the thorn. And all of a sudden, Red Zone Rogue has gone from 17 down to 4, and it all started in some ways thanks to the red hunting demigod. We see a blue razor and wounded bull. Two generics in hand, and uh, Cal's definitely going to be looking at some type of block here. Yeah, I mean, he has to, right? He's at four, and there are there is that casual five damage, just, you know, just lethal being presented. So the Blue Razor, at least because of Kel's AB2 in the Null Rune Hood and the Arcane Lantern, can soak up the entire uh, Arcane damage that was being presented. Um, otherwise, you know, that, that Thorn tends to leak, but AB2 is going to shore that up. There's still too physical to contend with here. So now it's the choice of block two with that Wounded Bull. Okay, that is what he goes for, uh, or Arsenal instead. But that's not what we're going to see. Gonna preserve the life a little bit, maybe work for a stronger arsenal if he can manage it, or perhaps just protect life just so Kel can stay in the freaking game. <laughs> yeah, Mark was uh, either having a wee look at what's sort of left in the deck, what's left in the grave out, or showing the fans at home the uh, the remnants of the fireworks that just went off that turn. Kyle's gonna have to do a bit of thinking here. Is he going to keep trying to push that damage through with his? that has not as many go-agains as Mark's, or is he going to look at possibly thinking about the fatigue strategy of defending hard, preventing that arcane damage, and um, seeing who can reach the bottom of the deck first. Mark's back in the driver's seat here. He's, uh, he's thinking of a few options this turn. Stubby Hammer is, is still available, and that is a very, very tempting card to activate. Yeah, last turn was actually enabled not even by a Seeds of Agony, not even by a Stubby Hammers. Last turn was just everything can't, Chain can do anyway. Uh, but we see the Stubby Hammers popped now, and a Seeds of Agony played out now. So this this might be another unfair turn, a turn that at the very least should present lethal once or at least twice over if Mark really wants to be flashy about it. And that's what we see already. Four damage coming in, uh, not triggering the arcane damage, but four, still casual lethal. Yeah, casual lethal we are looking at here. We've got four, and um, Stubby Hammer is pushing the attack value up by one. We've got a defense of three, so we're looking to leak over... Yep, Cow's taking one more damage there. We have go again from the Soul Shackle. Here's Cow's new favorite card out here, Red Bounding Demigon <laughs> coming in with go again for four damage. That's going to take, well, probably one card, potentially two. Yeah, it already took two in a way because the Seeds of Agony triggered there and Kel decided at this point, go ahead and pitch into it and try to just save that HP where he can. So coming in with the three block does still leak one damage. Uh, but so overall, you know, Mark still dealt 50% of the remaining HP Kel had on the table here, but Kel did keep a singular card. Is that card really going to pull him through? I guess we'll, we'll see in a second here. I can't imagine it can be anything too flashy. Um, unless it's something along the lines of maybe, is he going to, oh, it is the cash in. All right. That's the actual best card he could have on a one card hand there because it just straight turns into two cards. Yeah. The silver, which, uh, doesn't seem to be of too much use without these assassin equipments. However, cash in, yeah. Going from one card in hand, drawing two. So getting some fresh ones here. Cal does have a chance to take this game still, despite what the, uh, the life and previous board states have been looking like. We've got Cracker Jacks available for uh, some type of attack action to get plus one. Snapdragon Scalers is still in the mix, so two cards from Cal could pre present nine damage very easily off zero resources. Yeah, because there's even the Blossom of Spring, right? Uh, so there are three cards that can be used very aggressively, even from a spot like this. That two card hand, maybe it's a one for five. Maybe it's, uh, you know, accompanied by a zero for four. Well, hey, he can turn that into 10 damage presented if that's what Kel drew up. Now, we don't know, but there are still lines here that should make Mark scared at least a little bit. Because if Kel can present enough damage, that scares Mark down into having to block. Perhaps that really throws off the hand that Chain was looking to have into this next turn. And then if the wheels fall off, blood debt can rack up and then that can deal some damage. And, you know, things can align. Things can align for Kel at the end of the day, honestly. 
Yeah, Plunder the Poor coming in. One of those zero for fours. We are contracting cards, taking a look at the top of the deck. We're, we're seeing a Soul Reaping here. Uh, a very large attack, which can come in for a very little cost. So that's going straight to the bottom of the deck. Four damage here. Now, uh, the Assassin class has, some say, the best attack reactions in the game. And with two cards in hand, yeah, Mark is very much incentivized to defend. Even though he is on a, a little bit of a higher life total there. Arachne's attack reaction step is very, very unpredictable. So it is a very smart and safe play. Even being ahead on a few cards and points of life for Mark to defend there. The Soul Shackles triggering. We see another Rift Bind and a, uh, a Howl from Beyond go into the Banish Zone. No, no, that's three more cards. That is Seeds of Agony again, which uh, in, in oh, this spot yeah. is always the kind of card that Mark's looking for because it's an enabler for straight up cards like Bounding Demigon. They need that non attack to be played out. And now that combo is just sitting right there in the banner zone. We're already seeing part of that played out uh, with that yellow seeds into a blue Shrilla Skull form that has seen an aura made because of the Soul Shackle that's giving itself go again. So it's coming in for five, which is definitely presenting lethal at this point. And and banking that one arcane for later in the chain, just a looming threat, if you will. Yeah, one arcane in the bank. There's always another looming threat of the thorn just uh, out there, just past the horizon. But first, we've got to deal with the shrill of skull form five. Go again from the soul shackle, and it's still just presenting so much damage that Kel has to respect because otherwise the game is just over and. You know, maybe ending the game a bit early is a bit of a saving grace for Kel because there is just a relentless onslaught. No matter how you slice this pie, Chain will present so much damage turn after turn as these Soul Shackles ramp up. He's already at four. He's already banked two attacks now in that Ghostly Visit in the Bounding Demigon that are presenting probably not both in the same turn here, and especially not if the next attack is a Tremor of Arathriel instead. So this doesn't have go again. This is going to be the final attack on the combat chain. It's coming in for six physical. It's going to trigger that Seeds of Agony. So seven damage presented total. If Kel has even one two block in hand here, he will fall. All he'll be able to do is block out the five, and that would be all they wrote. So we'll see on the block how he's thinking about this turn. Now, Chris, unfortunately, I lost him in this bit of audio uh, hiccups that I've been having. Uh, so we'll power, power on with this last turn, just me. And sure enough, that is five block alone. So that'll actually be the game. That is Chain taking it over Arachne. Congrats to Mark Johnson. Sorry about that, Kel, but don't worry, not out of this yet. Well, that was an exciting match. Not exactly the, the climactic finish that Arachne had when they killed the Emperor right in the throne room. Uh, instead, we saw Chain come out as the victor this time. No surprise there, honestly. Uh, but Kel put on a good showing. And truly, congratulations to Mark. The guy is fantastic at playing flesh and blood and sequenced out that turn two really 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 well uh granted it was off the back of that bounding demagon hit that really spiraled things out of control for kel but honestly well done yeah mark started off a little slow we even saw a rosetta thorn for two physical only um but yeah it, it was that blind red demigon that really started to cause trouble for cal we saw 17 points to 10 at one point, and uh, then in one turn, there were, I, must have been 17 links, but there was something like that. <laughs> a lot of go agains, a lot of damage. There was arcane. There was there were plunder runs involved. The stubby hammer is only added between one and three damage, but uh, it was enough. It was more than enough, and uh, a fantastic game. It got a little, it got a little bit out of uh, Arachne's reach near the end, but it was. I think a fantastic showcase of the power of what some of these clash decks can do. Right. And you know, you take down one spider more inhabit the web. I, is, is that what spiders do? No, they don't take over each other's webs, but you get it. You get it. You know, there's this whole assassin network out there. So chain don't oh, sleep feeling? easy tonight. Yeah. yeah. Come on, man. You got to stay scared. Uh, but that was an exciting game. We're wrapping up today's video here. Uh, and reminder that, Hey, these decks are not out of contention. We might see Red Zone Rogue back. He's now moved on to the loser's bracket instead where he'll be playing out his matches, uh, whereas we'll be paying more attention to the winner's bracket here where we'll see the chain deck again, maybe put on another slapping, 
uh, maybe get fatigued out, maybe get outraced. There's a lot of ways that those games can go. But the immediate next game on hand is going to be Icelander versus Azalea coming at you tomorrow. So it should be pretty exciting. Chris, you're joining me again. Can't wait, my friend. Thank you.